It's good afternoon. May I have your attention, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Marcus Kilmer. I'm the co-facilitator of this best practice forum on cybersecurity with Ben Wallace, who's sitting next to me, who will be the rapporteur of this session. Uh, let me start by reminding you a little bit where we come from. The sharing of best practices was right from the beginning always a name of the IGF. The IGF is here not to negotiate, but here to exchange information and to share best practices. But it was only in 2014 where we actually made a step forward by having more structured best practice forums. And these forums produce an output. There is a paper at the end of the session. And it is a process. It's more than just this session. This session here is the culmination of a process. And the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity ha has followed two best practice forums. One was on unsolicited com communication, spam, and the other one on C certs. After two years, we thought they had done their job, but there was still a lot of work to be done in this area. And it was kind of a merger of these previous best practice forums. And we have now been going for a number of years. And this year, in a sense, is quite special. I think it falls, it's very timely, our work. It, you will recall we were in Paris last year, and there was the Paris call. And when we had our session, the best practice forum session in Paris, it was felt that we have to look at it. But it was also clear we are not here to develop new principles. So we took an approach that we look at the implementation of principles. But with that, I give hand over to the guy who has actually led the work. He was the lead expert and has done most of the heavy lifting, and he will chair the session, make the substantive work. Over to you, Martin, please. Thank you very much, Marcus. And also a big thank you to uh, Ben Wallace, who is a co-convener of this Best Practices Forum. Now, in order to kick this off, I'm actually going to do something a bit unusual for the IGF. I'm going to start off with a few slides. Uh, so if you could get those on the screen, thank you. What I wanted to do is give you a bit of context behind the Best Practices Forum in the last few years. Uh, as Marcus mentioned, uh, the Best Practices Forum really started as two different groups, one focused on computer security incident response teams, and the other one focused on unsolicited communications. Now, in 2016, uh, both of those groups essentially merged into what is today the Best Practices Forum on Cybersecurity. And over time, we've addressed a number of different uh, concepts uh, over those years. The first one is that we looked at roles and responsibilities um, of, in, within cybersecurity. So what do particular stakeholder groups do and how do they work together? We then investigated cooperation problems. So what are the challenges for um, security teams to cooperate with other stakeholder groups? We looked at how cybersecurity can support the sustainable development goals, and we really came up with a document that contained a lot of policy best practices uh, for implementing cybersecurity policies. And we also took a look that year, which was in uh, 2017, at what that would mean in terms of bringing the next billion users online in a secure manner. And then finally, last year in 2018, we laid the foundation for what the work of this year looked like, and that was to investigate what the concepts of culture, norms, and values meant for cybersecurity. And we took a really very wide multi-stakeholder look at spaces for norms development. So we looked at individual organizations that were proposing, identifying, or uh, cascading norms and how they worked. This year, we took a slightly deeper look at that, and we started identifying um, what best practices exist regarding opera operationalization of cyber norms. So the general idea was that we took specific agreements that were signed within stakeholder groups and analyzed to see what we could learn from that that would actually be valuable to share back with the wider community in internet governance. And we took an approach over the year where in March we really started the initiative. Uh, we started scoping agreements that had been signed both within stakeholder groups and between stakeholder groups and started to identify commonalities and collecting some best practices from those agreements. 
And one thing that I definitely want to flag is that, as with any best practices forum, this group is completely um, driven by the contributions of many of the people in the room and many of those who have uh, contributed to the mailing list over the last year. And we really value that, that input. In June and July, we did some background research. We took a selection of 19 agreements and worked to determine what were horizontal components, so definitions, foundational principles that were shared, and finally, key elements that these agreements covered. By July, we published a research paper that talked in a little bit more detail on each of these agreements and what we learned from them. And just as a bit of background, the 19 agreements we reviewed, we roughly bucketed them into agreements that exist within a stakeholder group and also agreements that are actually signed um, by multiple different stakeholder groups. And that was by itself quite challenging because even an agreement that is only developed and signed by one stakeholder group may have actually been compiled with multi-stakeholder input. So quite often the simple definition um, of an agreement being single or multi-stakeholder doesn't always work. What was interesting was that we did see that there's a larger number of agreements within a particular stakeholder group than there are agreements that are actually purely multi-stakeholder, uh, though there does seem to be a trend towards more and more of the latter arising. Each of those 19 agreements uh, we reviewed for a couple of key elements. We evaluated whether those agreements furthered multi-stakeholderism as a concept, whether they had a reference to vulnerability equities processes, if they included some uh, reflection on responsible or coordinated disclosure, um, how they related to international law, so whether they actually uh, were international legal components or if they were instead documentation that may have acknowledged the value of international law or in a way implemented it. We looked at the definitions that they entailed. Did they describe what a cyber threat was or a cyber attack? We looked at their reflection on capacity building and if that was a value within the agreement whether they specified specific confidence building measures, whether they had a reference to human rights or a reference to content restrictions. And based on taking that lens on each agreement, uh, we tried to deepen our understanding of each of the agreements and then publish that in the research paper that was published in July. We then, between August and November, did a call for contributions uh, where the goal was to ask for input on the work that had been done and also get more best practices that individual um, organizations that signed up to the agreement had actually implemented. And we received um, quite a few responses from organizations that had either driven a particular agreement or had contributed. And this is work that we're now taking into the final paper as we work towards publishing it um, in December uh, of 2019, so in a few weeks. We do have some specific outputs planned from this session as well. So the goal for today is that we have a really solid discussion with a, an expert panel and with all of you about cyber norms and very specifically how we move from identifying a norm to operationalizing, operationalizing one. And that information will make its way back into the paper and then we have a few places where we plan to share those learnings, uh, one of them being the open-ended working group in their intersessional meeting next week. Now for today, we have a couple of different key topics that we'll talk about and I'll introduce them really briefly before we head into uh, the panel. Um, the first one is norms operationalization. So we're going to be looking at what is really the role of norms and what do our panelists think is the balance between the fact that a norm can often just be observed because many people agree versus whether a norm actually needs to be implemented. So does there need to be work that happens to cascade that norm further in the international system or between stakeholders? We'll have a look at what are effective efforts to actually operationalize a norm. So I'll ask all of the panelists to share some examples on what they have seen work. We'll also look at the road ahead, like what are the things that don't exist today that we need to be building? And what are some of the challenges that we're seeing um, as some of these norms are being worked on in the international system? And finally, we'll briefly talk about assessment. How do we actually know that these norms are working? And when do we not know when they're working? And is there anything that we need to do to improve that status? Now, I'd like to briefly introduce our panelists. Um, and first of all, we have one remote panelist. That's uh, Karina Birarda from the CSIRT of the Buenos Aires uh, Cybersecurity Center. Um, she represents the technical community and will be participating remotely. 
We have uh, Sheetal Kumar from Global Partners Digital, who is representing civil society. We have John Herring uh, from Microsoft, representing private sector. Olaf Kolkman from the uh, Internet Society, who is here on behalf of the technical community. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Alexander Klimberg from the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, which is a multi-stakeholder norms uh, initiative. Before we go into the panel, I also invited someone very special here, actually, because it was, I believe, two years ago um, at the IGF in Geneva when we had a very great discussion around, actually, whether a norm is something that you observe, which is very much the original take uh, from Katzenstein when he sort of developed and shared the concept of a social norm, or whether um, and how implementation and operationalization actually fits in. So I'd like to introduce Madeline Carr, who's Professor of Global Politics and Cybersecurity at UCL, and also Director of the Research Institute in Science of Cybersecurity from the Academia um, Stakeholder Group to share some of her thoughts on that concept. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, and, um, and thanks to Martin and Ben and, and um, the whole BPF for not only for putting this um, panel together, but also really um, heartfelt thanks for the work that you have been doing over the, the, the year on this, because I think the paper is something that's really useful to all of us who work in this space, that mapping exercise. So... Um, Martin asked me to talk a little bit about uh, this issue of whether norms are, are simply observed or whether they, the, you know, where implementation fits into this. And it's, it's something that I think a lot of us are, are thinking about and working on at the moment. I thought it would be helpful to just very quickly go back over how we actually think about norms and where some of the common confusion around norms and rules uh, comes in. Because... Uh, um, so a norm is really a collective expectation for what we see as proper behavior for, for an a, um, identifiable group. Right? So, and, and there's some important elements in there. One is that it's a collective perception within a group. Um, so it's not universal, it's not something that applies, it can't apply to people who don't want it to apply to them or actors that don't uh, agree with it. A norm is something that's internalized and that's re respected by the actors who, who identify with it. Um, and it's about what proper behavior is. M maybe uh, active behavior or restraining from behavior that's inappropriate. Now, sometimes when we talk about norms in this space, we're not really talking about norms. We're talking about norm, what we might say are normative aspirations. We aspire to, to, to uh, regard something as, as a norm. But that's, that's uh, you know, getting into some kind of muddy water because the actual yeah. power of norms as opposed to rules is that they don't really need to be imposed. In fact, norms can't be imposed. Norms is something that we all internalize and we value. Um, rules can be imposed and can be enforced, but norms don't work like that. So we, can't, we often run into this kind of point of confusion about what a, what a norm is. Now, it's fine to aspire to norms and to discuss whether we can agree what we, we would regard as normative behavior. That's all fine. But, but norms don't need to be imposed. The very power of a norm is that it doesn't need to be imposed. Right? If it needs to be imposed, then there isn't a norm. So, so, so I just want to keep that um, sort of front and center when we talk today. If we think then about how do we observe norms or how do we know when there is a norm, there are a couple of ways. So the, the first way that we can understand that there is a norm in place or a norm in play is when we observe the behavior of actors that don't adhere to what is expected behavior. Right? Because it, if, if an actor uh, does something which is uh, understood to be inappropriate, then they will either try to hide that or they will deny that they have done it or they may justify their behavior. And if they do any of those three things, then that can signal to us that there is a norm in place. Otherwise, they would just openly say, no, I have done that and I'm absolutely fine with that. 
So the very fact of trying to hide behavior or, or deny behavior can sometimes be indicative that there is a, a norm in, in play. That's one way that we can identify a norm. The second way is, in a, and in a kind of a more positive way, that actors would, would wish to uh, express that they adhere to a norm is by thinking about how to move from the sometimes the very abstract, the, the, the norms that we, we discuss can be very abstract and very vague, how to actually move from that to a concrete kind of uh, expression of that norm. And so now we see actors... Um, looking at the norms that have been proposed and trying to map on their own behavior of, of, how, they, um, of how they abide by or recognize that norm as, as you know, a, a guiding expectation of behavior. Um, so, yes, I'll leave it there, Martin. Just that, that recognition that there's a difference between norms and rules and that understanding when there is a norm can come from observing uh, an actor that's not abiding by that norm, trying to disguise their behavior, or as we start talking about implementation, how actors try and express, I do respect that norm, and, and this is how I, how, I, uh, how I respect it. Thank you very much, Madeline. That was a wonderful introduction, and I think it, it actually sets uh, the tone a bit for the work that we ended up doing throughout the year, because we looked at documents that went from being norms proposals to uh, legally binding documents. And along that space, we determined that there's a lot of spaces for disagreement and discussion that can show whether or not it's actually a norm. So really appreciate that, uh, that intro. Now, um, we'll jump straight into the panel. And the first thing we really want to get a bit of an understanding on from everyone is what they see as the role of norms in this space. Um, and in particular, for those of the panelists who have been involved in developing um, a particular agreement or a particular norm or have signed up to it and are in the process of helping further it, it would be great to get their perspective on um, where it fits on the um, scale of it's something that is simply observed through some of the mechanisms that Madeline talked about, or it's something that actually requires a lot of work to further cascade into the system. And we'll get started with Sheetal. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I thought that the introduction by Madeline was really interesting because it reminds us that norms, fundamentally, they, they shape behavior, and so they're incredibly important. They can be invisible. Um, and I think the fact that they, they take time is part of, it's kind of like a double-sided coin. It's part of the fact that they are effective. Because if you impose them through rules, through laws um, at the beginning, if they don't actually have buy-in, they won't go anywhere. But then at the same time, <laughs> obviously that makes them difficult to implement. Um, but I think cyberspace is, is a really fascinating context to be talking about because what stakeholder obligations are in cyberspace um, and promoting and protecting cybersecurity is really an evolving discussion. Not all stakeholders agree what the issues are. Not all stakeholders agree who needs to solve them, how. That's why something more binding, I think, at this stage is simply unfeasible. Um, and what, what uh, role norms are playing at the moment is in filling policy gaps, in shaping understanding and shaping collective understanding of what the issues are. And I think that's why we've seen so much norm proliferation, which is sort of sometimes leads to holding your head in your hands, being like, oh my goodness, another norm initiative. But I don't think that's been a bad thing at all. And what's, what's the challenge now is to identify commonalities amongst all of the proposals that have been proposed. Um, and identify where there's consensus, which is one thing which the BPF has done, I think has been really interesting. Um, I understand there are many other initiatives doing that, identifying commonalities. I think um, the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace is, un is undertaking um, a project like that. The GFCE, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, has started doing um, an exercise in that. And that's going to be the next stage, as well as obviously implementing and ob observing the norms. But I think we also have to realize that there are challenges, and I, I just think um, one of the most interesting aspects of the report the BPF has put together has been in identifying and actually asking those um, who input it into the, the report, what are the challenges you've faced? And I thought that was just fascinating. And I think one of the things that we found um, at GPD in our engagement on this issue 
is that, first of all, there are varied understandings or definitions of the key terminologies referred to in, 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 the no in norms, including in the norms of the um, group of governmental experts of the UN. So like critical infrastructure, what's that, right? So there's, there's still challenges in understanding that. There's varied levels of awareness of the existence of norms even among states and other stakeholders. There's varied um, ability to, uh, or capacity to implement them. Another challenge is... Um, the, the varied capacity to trace or attribute incidents in cyberspace. I know we hear a lot about that, and there's evolving capacity in that sense, but, it, but there's definitely a, um, a mix of capacity, and there's a lack of trust among states and other um, stakeholders or a neutral body to, you know, with legitimacy in that sense. And unfortunately, I think there's also a lack of compliance, including among states that have traditionally championed norms, um, and, and that can act as a disincentive for, for others to comply with them. And, and that links to the, the other challenge, the final challenge I'll, I'll mention here, which is a lack of clear institutional mechanisms or processes to monitor and report on compliance. So there are a lot of challenges. Um, and I think one, of the, one, one thing that I really want to highlight is that um, there's a need for norm development and implementation processes to be inclusive. So the very nature of the Internet obviously demands um, a, a role for every, every stakeholder. And one, one thing that we've um, come across as human rights defenders in this space is the lack of understanding amongst human rights defenders and human rights organizations between the norms that are being proposed and, their, um, and human rights. But there are very clear links between human rights and the norms um, that are being proposed. And really, it just goes to a very fundamental point, which is that the security of the Internet, security of digital technologies... Um, is essential for the exercise of human rights in the digital age. So more security, better security measures means a better um, environment, a healthy environment for the exercise of human rights. It's really as simple as that. And everyone has a role to play in ensuring that. Um, one, one thing that GPD has done um, with APC, the Association of Progressive Communications, is undertake an exercise uh, explaining specifically what are the links between human rights and each of the GGE norms, and what are the um, roles that human rights defenders are already playing in implementing the, the norms. So one, one role that comes out a lot, that comes across a lot, is in monitoring, in, in research, in providing an evidence base, in bringing the perspective of vulnerable populations um, and the impact of, for example, cyber attacks on vulnerable populations, in holding institutions to account. These are all essential roles that need to be played in order to make sure that the norms are being complied with. So just to conclude, I would say norms have an incredibly important role to play in the current landscape um, that we're, we're in, which is one where every stakeholder has different ideas of what the issues are and who needs to be involved. Um, they help to shape common understandings. Um, and because of the nature of the Internet and the challenge at hand, the norm development and implementation process needs to be inclusive. Um, and uh, civil society is an essential role to play in that regard. Um, I hope that that was a good start, but I'm very happy to go into more um, later, including more concrete examples of how uh, civil society groups, including ourselves and others we've been working with, have been implementing the norms. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive overview. And I think the, the key word in, in what you said for me was really inclusion, because it feels like sometimes norms development doesn't always include the different parties that later on have to work with that norm or in some way affected by it. And um, for one specific group where I think that has happened in the past, being a member of that community myself, um, which is a technical community, we're actually going to jump over to Karina first. Um, and then we'll talk to Olaf really briefly and get their perspective on this. So we'll jump over to our uh, remote participant, Karina. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karina Virarda. I work at the Buenos Aires Government Cyber Security Center. Um, it's been a pleasure having contributed to the confession of the cybersecurity agreement reports. Uh, I would like to thank to the organizer for the invitation to this panel. For me, it's an honor and to be part and to be able to speak in representation of Latin America technical community. Um, I consider that the standards are necessary as a good practices framework to be implemented besides each country city and organization may have their particularity and budget. Um, that application is necessary. 
And I personally, personally, I have to say an, um, an international ISO standards lead auditor related to information security, resilience, and cybersecurity. Because of that, I am a very good friend of the standards. In my daily work, I am involved in the implementation of good cybersecurity practice rules and controls or controls. Um, methodology, norms, and controls are necessary to know and lay on the organization's resource, technology, and human capacities, processes, pending implementation. And by knowing this, being able to measure the cybersecurity maturity level and implement continuous improvement, which are the main points. I have to say a very good benefit of the technical community is how general it is. It is. Um, the information flows quickly, just like collaboration. This trustful connection is based on years of being part of the technical group and particular research. Um, that's all for me. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much Karina. Um, all of what's your view on uh, on norms and particularly the role that they play and, and uh, how those specifically that come from the technical community fit in? Yeah, um, so does this work? Yeah, I think it does. Um, something that I just realized when we had the conversation and, and, and thank you, Madeline, that was a, uh, a, a nice summary that uh, I put into work all the cerebral cells there. Um, something I just realized that uh, even at this table, we, when we talk about norms, we might actually, from our hearts or our mindset or our background, think of different things. Um, if you're German uh, and you hear the word DIN, um, that's the Deutsche Industrie Norme, you think about good quality shit that's been built in, in the German industry. Um, ne the NEN is the Dutch variety of that, and those set technical standards for plugs, for, uh, for length, for, for anything. Those are not the type of norms that I think you talked about and not the type of norms that you just talked about. In the technical community, like uh, in the ITF, we have been developing uh, best current practices, which are shared ideas of how to best operate networks. Uh, one of the best current practices is, for instance, the filtering of uh, addresses that come out of your network that should actually be your own addresses, so to speak. Um, and those are practices that prevent spoofing on the internet, and spoofing uh, of addresses is a major uh, factor in denial of services attacks. Now, the problem with all these best current practices is that they are voluntary norms, voluntary standards that are not always well uh, uh, taken up by, uh, by the community. Um, and that takes me to a second type of norm, uh, which uh, we at the Internet Society and the, and the community of network operators are working on, uh, which is the, the, the mutually agreed norms for routing security. That is more a behavioral type of norm, uh, a set of commitments to deploy or take certain actions that will secure the routing system as a whole. Um, and I, I think that is a little bit on, on the edge between very concrete technical descriptions of how you do uh, the best operational practices um, and a setting a mutual expectation between all the network operators with the added benefit that by demonstrating the, um, the actions that you take and signing up to these norms, you create a little bit of an economic incentive to do the good thing. So by showing that you adhere to the norm, showing that you are part of the club, you might maybe get a little bit more business or a little bit more goodwill, which is a value in the cases where a lot of these security norms, like anti-spoofing, 
um, are in fact plagued by reverse uh, economic incentives. You protect the outside world and not yourself. Um, I'll leave it at that, but I, I think there is a, a, a there there that is a little bit between that norm that you were talking about and, and you and, and the, the very technical norms that you see out of the technical community, IETF, or the Deutsche Industrie Norme, or uh, uh, things like NEN. Thank you, Olaf. And uh, I like the way that you flagged that there's different perspectives on what norms really are. And uh, we actually have someone here who spent the last few years really bringing together different people with very different perspectives to sort out exactly that. So, Alexander, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you again to you and your team for pulling this together. We've been following this process uh, the last four years with great interest, and we think it's a great enrichment of the IGF landscape. Um, my comments kind of follow on directly what all I've said beforehand, which is rather convenient since all, since all of us one of the commissioners on our global commission, and I would like to expand on what he was saying rather than contradict him. Um, it's also very easy to do so because we have indeed a number of different interpretations of what the term norm means. So as a bit of a backgrounder, um, the Global Commission was set up in 2017 to address international security norms. So we are a group of 28 high-level commissioners, high-level experts, both from the government, the security services, but also from internet governance, the rights community, who have basic experience with internet-related security issues. And the issue at stake was we had a mission to develop norms and policies. But even defining what exactly what a norm was, was a little bit tricky, because a norm within the international security landscape, in particular, for instance, the, the one defined by the UN GGE process, is quite different from the technical norms that are simply used as simply an expression. And to give you another further example, from, for instance, some government point of view, there is a difference between a norm and a CBM, a confidence building measure which is actually in some ways implementation of a norm. So there's a lot of shades of gray here, and in actually international discussions you can get quite holed up by these shades of gray, and that actually kind of inhibits you and kind of gets some traction and also identifying the norms that need to get done. So one of the norms that we identified as part of the eight norms that are part of our report, which was recently put out at the Paris Peace Forum, also includes four principles and six recommendations I would encourage you to have a look at. One of those norms was the norm to protect the public core of the internet. Thank you very much, Olaf, exactly. <laughs> we have many copies available, by the way, here, if you would like one. <laughs> so one of those norms was to protect the public core of the internet. I won't go into detail of that norm um, until later on, if you have any queries on it, but effectively it's self-explanatory. It's about dealing with the core infrastructure of the norm and protect it from hostile, malicious uh, actions. This can be DNS attacks, attacks on DNS, attacks on BGP, um, it can be also attacks on the physical transmission media. The point here was is that we uh, found a specific need that was not addressed through the 11 GGE norms and also wasn't adequately covered, we thought, in the technical norms that were propagated. And so we took those inspiration, also from our commissioners, to find how we could put forward something that would be commiserate with international law, which is the focus of our work. We're not trying to change internet governance. We're trying to influence the UN First Committee discussions on international cybersecurity and basically be understandable to them. But what it meant was, in the internet governance community and other communities, the, the question keeps on being raised, what does this actually mean for us? What does this mean in practice? What does this mean with implementation oper operationalization? And that's where you can see that there's a lot of different understandings of what the term norm means. For instance, we just heard beforehand the definition according to Katzenstein. We follow more, for instance, Finnemore's definition of a norm. And we also, for instance, would say, that norms can indeed be imposed, even though that's not necessarily something you want to do. But if you think back with experience, for instance, of slavery in the 19th century, the norm against slavery was imposed on other nations. So that did actually take a while, and it wasn't only the soft power element that made other countries ad adhere to it. So we see this through the lens of international security, and when we talk about implementation rather than operationalization, we also try to look at the fine grain gray area of what actually does it mean to implement a norm. And we, for instance, saw this as a problem for the UNGGE. One of the norms they put out was effectively that the CERT, so the computer emergency response teams, would be immune for, to attack. Now, it took years for first to ever hear of the fact that they, in fact, were the target of a norm to protect their activity. And that was a typical example of why they weren't necessarily motivated or incentivized to actually help monitor the adherence of this norm. This was one of the three most important norms that was agreed upon in 2015. 
So building on that experience of not having involved other stakeholders, even though they were absolutely critical for this norm, we also set out in one of our recommendations the idea of communities of interest for implementation. A communities of interest is effectively an expansion of the standard practice of like-minded groups coming together to further implement an already agreed standard um, or in diplomatic agreement. There are many examples in the diplomatic world as well. In this case, a community of interest, however, implies that other stakeholders, including civil society and the private sector, should be part of this group as well. So what we are proposing is that all of these norms that are out there, in particular, of course, the norms that we think are relevant for international security, the 11 GGE norms, the eight norms of the Paris call, our eight norms, all other norms that could be possibly relevant, that they generate their own subgroups of Im towards implementation that effectively helps not only explain to us what implementation means, but also sometimes helps explain exactly what the norms individually are. So to give you also an insight in, in what is happening, for instance, in the Asian Regional Forum in the UN, this is the big discussion for the next year, is what does norm implementation actually mean? If a government signs up to a norm, what does this actually mean? Consequence, does it have to actually review all the documents that are put out, all the policies that are set internally, even those that might be highly classified? How do they report norm violations, for instance, if some part of their government has done something not supposed to do? How do they, for instance, develop on their own ability so they don't in the future potentially violate these norms? These are very complicated questions, and I think government has been trying to answer these questions on their own for too long. And this is one of the reasons why we've been trying to engage in this community, is because so many of these norms not only directly reflect on this community, but also would benefit from their input. And this is the reason why I'm here today, and I really look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander, and thank you for showing us that worldview that sort of led to um, the GCSE and the, the work that you've been doing. I think that's very valuable. Um, now, finally, in our panel, we also have John Herrick from uh, Microsoft. Um, and John, for you specifically, one thing I'd be really interested in learning a little bit more about is um, you and, and Microsoft were very instrumental in sort of the, um, or one of the early signatories to the Paris call, which was a bit of a surprise last year at the IGF. Um, and that was a very interesting initiative by a government to drive a lot of this forward in a multi-stakeholder way. I was wondering if you could share a little bit of the learnings a year later that have come out of that process. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. And, and just wanted to start by thanking uh, you and Marcus and Dan and Wim and everyone else who sort of put in a lot of work to, to pulling this year's BPF together. We're very proud of being able to participate and, and support it. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, someone mentioned a proliferation of activity in this space, and there certainly has been. I, I, I think particularly from a coordination perspective, just given the, the amount of, even just in recent weeks, you know, the one-year anniversary of the Paris call, the GCSE report comes out, uh, the contract for the web, all of these things we would want to capture in this report, and that's just, you know, November. Um, and, it's <laughs> um, and so I, I think we were right to start off this conversation by appreciating the mantle of responsibility um, that we've inherited as IGF and as this best practice forum uh, when, when uh, President Macron announced the Paris call last year um, at, the, at the outset of this, of this gathering. Um, and, and just in that same way, we should appreciate that we're giving that mantle back and that this, this chaotic uh, ac set of productive activities across multi-stakeholder groups um, has come to a head in an exciting time um, to provide contributions in the UN dialogues that are just getting started again. Um, so with that urgency in mind um, and that timing in mind, I, I'd be glad to give an update on the Paris call for trust and security in cyberspace, which is certainly an agreement that Microsoft has been very excited about and very proud to support. Um, it has been over the past year and, and since it was launched, the largest ever multi-stakeholder commitment to cybersecurity principles. Um, it has nine principles uh, <laughs> as opposed to eight, forgiven. Um, and, uh, but, but what's, what's significant about it is, is what's happened over the past uh, year. And, and so for anyone who's not aware, about two weeks ago, uh, it celebrated its first anniversary. And, and like any good infant, there's been a lot of growth in that first year. Um, there's now uh, over seven, or there are now 75 uh, government supporters, uh, endorsements for the agreement that represents 40% um, of all UN member states. Um, there are over 300 supporters from civil society and academia alone. Um, that represents an over 300% increase from that sector in terms of support from the first year. Um, there are now over 600 supporters from industry, including um, you know, major representatives from essential sectors, including the financial sector, the uh, technical community, critical infrastructure sectors, depending on how you define that. Um, and that represents an over 200% increase uh, in that number of supporters from, from last year. Um, and then, so this all seems to reflect a, a multi-stakeholder consensus, or at least a developing consensus about what constitutes responsible behavior. And it's important to recognize that the principles of the Paris call are not original. 
Uh, these are things which are uh, derivative, highly so, from various international agreements, uh, most prominently uh, the, the UN Group of Governmental Experts, uh, 11 norms from 2015. Um, so what this really is, is a widening of the aperture and recognizing uh, the importance of having a multi-stakeholder community supporting these principles, to take them forward and to have those conversations about implementation, which re will require multiple sectors, multiple stakeholder groups um, acting in cooperation. Um, and so that's why it's also important to recognize that not just the Paris call has grown over the past year, um, but it's also had a pivot um, towards talking about what it means to live out these principles, starting to build these communities of interest that uh, Quimber was talking about just a moment ago. Uh, the French government launched a new Paris Call website uh, along with the one year anniversary two weeks ago, uh, which includes on it the, the beginnings of, of highlighting what different supporters of the agreement are doing in, in cooperation with one another and individually uh, to, to support and live out those respective principles. Uh, Microsoft and, and through our support of the Cybersecurity Tech Accord as well is, is leading a few of those efforts. Um, Others are being led by, by intergovernmental organizations and other multi-stakeholder members of the, of the Paris Call community. Um, so that's where things stand now, and so we're excited to see what more can happen with that body to sort of live out these principles as we go forward. Thank you very much for that update, John. Um, next, one thing that I'd like all of the panelists to, to sort of think about for a moment and then share is one very concrete and specific example um, of a norms implementation effort that they've seen that has been particularly effective. And I'd like them to think a little bit about uh, what actually made it effective and how that can contribute. And to make it a bit easier, uh, Olaf already mentioned, I think, one great norm example, uh, Manners. Uh, so maybe we'll get started with you, Olaf, and you can share some of your view. Yeah, um, the, the, I cannot claim that we've been effective yet um, uh, because the routing system clearly is not secure yet. Um, however, um, uh, since the start of the, of the effort about two years ago, uh, we have seen uh, uh, a significant growth in the effort, an exponential, um, but exponential at the start of exponential growth is still in the low, uh, uh, about 250 participants. Um, what made this a effort uh, that I think is successful is that we started with the community. This is not an Internet Society initiative. Um, the role of the Internet Society in this is uh, the facilitation of the community to self-organize and come up with exactly the type of things they can and want to do in order to get routing security to the next level. One of the pieces of the success there is that we, that the community has agreed to be part of the effort, you have to take three out of four very specific actions. And I will not go into the technical details, but they are defined on a semi sort of high level uh, action as thou shall apply filtering, uh, thou shall uh, uh, register um, uh, your, 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 your routes and so on and so forth. Um, and what we do is we uh, allow people to self-declare that they have taken those actions and then uh, uh, sign up to the website. Um, and after they did that, they have this, uh, well, this extra brand of quality, so to speak. So I think that is an important driver. On the other hand, that has also made us aware that you have to take good care of the quality. Um, and we will be talking a little bit about monitoring, um, but for us, that monitoring is very important because you can both recognize norm violations, but also the take up of the norm itself and the impact it has on what you're actually trying to solve. So we're looking at the evolution of routing incidents and we are looking at where do these, do these routing incidents come from and how are they tied to the people who have signed up to uh, the mutual agreed norm uh, for routing security manners. Um, I can go a little bit deeper if people want, but let's, let's take it at that because I think that was about the level that you... Thank you, Olaf. That was great. And I think Manor specifically is a very interesting example because it's one of those things where when I watch Twitter and I see positive news, it's, uh, for instance, an ISP announcing that they've implemented some of these pieces. And that's a very nice thing to see because it kind of confirms that if they're bragging that they did it, it means that it's something that is generally seen as being really important. And there's already enough bad news on Twitter. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Except for the occasional cut to the <laughs> 
Um, then I'd like to move over to John really briefly, because John, you mentioned that there's work ongoing to actually compile some of these learnings um, and share them. So is there one specific solid example that you can share of something that Microsoft has done there? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> the question of implementation, I think, is, is, a, is a fairly sort of nebulous one, because as was sort of stated at the outset, um, this idea of what a norm is uh, frequently is something that, that almost like dark matter is, is uh, unobserved, and so you, you've sort of been acting in accordance with it, um, whether or not it was sort of explicitly stated. Um, and so in compiling uh, Microsoft's contribution to this BPF, um, which I highly encourage everyone to read, um, it's, a, it's a lengthy uh, you know, six or seven pages, um, which is thoroughly non-exhaustive of a, a, a list of activities Microsoft has either recently engaged in or historically been engaged in um, that are sort of in keeping and in the spirit of um, the, the Paris Call principles, the Cyber Security Accord principles, and various other agreements we have supported. Um, it, it does make a good holiday read, so as soon as you finish the Christmas Carol, I'd recommend taking out the Microsoft contribution to 2019 BPF cybersecurity. Um, but I, when, when I think about what's gonna be in direct response to agreements that have been signed or supported recently, um, I, I think I would focus again um, on, on the Paris Call or, or on the Cybersecurity Tech Accord. Um, thinking about what Microsoft has done, um, or is at least spearheaded now, that exists on the Paris Call website, um, there, are, there are three different initiatives that we're at least party to. Um, one of which is our, through our Defending Democracy program, uh, which is focused on promoting election security uh, through social innovations, through technological innovations, and, and, and through uh, legal actions. Um, we're working alongside the Alliance for Securing Democracy, a civil society organization, uh, to begin to build a community of partners explicitly around election interference to solve this problem um, at, at a larger scale. Uh, through the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, Microsoft is, is then um, supporting implementation of two principles for the Paris Call, uh, one of which is, is going to be fleshing out um, uh, definitions and best practices as it relates to the, uh, the eighth Paris Call principle on hacking back. Um, wh what that means in context and where the difference is between that and active defense and the implications, it's, it's something that industry uniquely needs to speak to and clarify, and so we're taking a role, again, in, in concert with the rest of the Tech Accord on that. And then also as part of the Tech Accord, taking responsibility for improving capacities. Uh, we're working with Cyber Green, um, the Internet Society, and the Global Cyber Alliance uh, to, to promote greater cyber hygiene and awareness uh, along with that Paris Call principle. Thank you, John. Um, Sheetal, one thing that for me was really interesting sort of following the evolution of norms is that more and more uh, civil society is also taking a larger role and we see a lot of these principles from human rights uh, principles related to intermediary liability and so on, where a lot of that is actually driven in civil society and then it makes its way into some of these documents and some of these recommendations. Do you have a good example from the civil society side on, on something that's been worked on recently? Um, yeah, and I th I'm glad that people have said it's hard to, um, hard to say what it means to implement or observe a norm because I'm sort of going to twist it on its head um, and say that where I think civil society has, done, um, has played a really important role is in monitoring compliance, actually. And that's not always clear. Um, but let's take the norm, the, the first norm of the, the GGE framework around, um, which, which says that states should not use ICTs or should prevent ICTs, ICT practices that are harmful or that may pose threats to international peace and security. So the way that we understand that is that that means not um, undertaking measures such as arbitrary surveillance or censorship or shutdowns, for example, in the name of security. But unfortunately, that, that does happen. Um, and civil society organizations over the past few years, as we've seen that trend, have been, I think, really important in highlighting when that's happening, where that's happening, documenting, and documenting the impact. So, um, I mean, there are countless examples, and m me highlighting some examples is in no way, I, um, I don't want to, um, uh, uh, in any way um, imply that there aren't many more examples. But just as, um, to highlight a few, there's Freedom House's Freedom on the Net report, for example, that documents these practices. Um, there's APCs, many publications, and inputs of the network, of their network of civil society organizations into um, the Human Rights Council procedures, for example, um, which document these um, measures. There's Access Now, um, the work it's done, and, and its digital security helpline. There's the Open Observatory of Network Interference. And I think the role here in making sure that these practices are being documented and also in offering um, recommendations and solutions for alternative and human rights respecting ways to address um, security um, challenges has been essential. And 
will, will need to continue. Um, and the more um, that we work to socialize these norms and to make sure that civil society organizations are aware of them, the more we can continue to do this work of monitoring compliance, which as we've just heard, is absolutely essential if these norms are going to be effective. Thank you very much. That's a, a really interesting perspective because I was more thinking of civil society contributes to what these things look like, but actually there is a really important role that a lot of civil society organizations play in, in kind of making sure that the things that we've actually talked about, that they are being lived up to, and when they're not, that it's being flagged to the rest of the community. So thank you, really appreciate it. Um, and then we'll jump over to Karina. Karina, can you maybe share an example of something that you've seen um, in the technical community in terms of an effective norms implementation or effort? Uh, sorry? Oh, can you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, perfect. Um, I'd like to tell you an internal experience. In the 2017, uh, when the B Buenos Aires CISO was created, in 2017, there was a milestone that were very defined, like being part of the first dot org. Um, in 27, then we became part of the OEA Americas Search. Um, as a milestone to share during the AR 2018, the Yacht Olympic Games were held in the Buenos Aires city. Uh, the Buenos Aires CISO was responsible for carrying out of the cybersecurity of the event. Uh, among the notable efforts we can mention within our team, clear groups were defined prevention, resolution, and operations team, multiple, multiple scenarios of possible incident, incident, incident sorry, uh, with different type of magnitude and critically scope, uh, where the log to define the resolution playbook for each of them. Active participation of multiple stakeholders, for example, Nineteen thirds, uh, the International Olympic Committee, and the national and international armed forces, and law. Uh, we work with a smart objective, a specific, measurable, uh, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Uh, all of a lot of achieve high efficiency in resolution of incident in a highly sensitive event such as the games and, and complied with established, established SLA of availability of the different services. Um, it was an intense and interactive experience for the whole world team. This is for sure. Great example of, uh, of how one particular event actually led to a lot of cooperation, documentation that then ended up being reused by others, which is, uh, I think, in many ways exactly what we're talking about. Um, Alexandra, I think you also wanted to contribute something related to uh, an example of an implementation effort. Uh, yeah, two comments that I thought might be pertinent. First of all, um, shameless plug for an article by Virgilio Almeida and myself and IEEE that basically stipulates um, that one possible solution to getting more norms implemented is simply generating more norms. <laughs> and the rationale for this was easily also to, uh, tracked with our analysis of, for instance, manners, which helped get another norm implemented, which is BCP 38. Um, and what we identified was is that certain norms are allowed that are voluntary, not binding, that are allowed to hang on their own without any kind of flanking or supporting mechanisms tend to struggle while norms that are effectively complementary and effectively have a similar goal or even the same goal, even if they don't have the same name, are much more likely to be successful. Um, this also applies, for instance, to our work towards the public core norm. So, for instance, not only did the Paris call 
take up five of our norms um, kind of directly, and we were closely involved in the, in the drafting of the Paris call, but also it also directly addressed the public core of the Internet, even though it didn't use exactly the definition that we did. Furthermore, the EU adopted the public core of the Internet as part of its Cybersecurity Act. So now that term is now part of EU regulation. But the exciting thing is, now it comes to the time of secondary legislation, where we need to effectively understand what exactly does the EU definition, for instance, mean. And that is a group endeavor. So this is when we actually have to implement these laws and these regulations. In this case, the EU Cybersecurity Act stipulates that ENISA's new task will include the protection of the global public core of the Internet. And that is actually something that has to be done in these communities of interest. So my final point is, is that, like Microsoft, the GCSE stakeholder groups, so the members of the different organizations that set up the GCSE, are looking at different types of, of communities of interest to take norm implementation forward. And you can be sure that the public core of the Internet is very, very clearly in our radar. And we've been talking with a number of governments and other stakeholder groups on how to effectively advance implementation of this norm, which will include monitoring, of course, and other types of facilitating endeavors. Thank you. Alexander, we'll actually stay with you for a second for the, the third topic that we wanted to dive into, which was um, what's the way forward? Because you just mentioned a couple of really interesting things. There was something there about packaging, as in like how do you actually like discuss these norms? How do you debate them? Uh, there's something there around for implementation that there needs to be these communities of interest. Um, in the document that you've released this week, there's also discussion on a framework. Mm. Do you think that there should be a common perspective on how we go and implement these norms? Or is this going to be something very specific to each norm and implementation may look very different? What are your thoughts? So I think, um, as we saw beforehand, we have a little bit of a problem sometimes having an uh, exact agreement on what a norm means. So we should be a little bit more careful about exactly what norm implementation means. I think it's more important that we talk about the general topics that are being addressed through these norms and see how we can try to facilitate their goals from our respective vantage points. International security will have a different view from the technical community, will have a different view from the internet governance community. So that, I think, would be a more important departure than actually the framework, although I have to say the framework of the cyber stability, uh, the GCSC, the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace, uh, which you can see, for instance, here, uh, <laughs> has been used by Avia Doria, for instance, in her presentation recently uh, in the ICANN meeting two days ago as an example of how perhaps other types of initiatives can be graded or can be effectively assessed. And of course, we encourage that. I mean, effectively, in, in an abstract way, that's a norm too, is effectively create a norm to effectively assess a framework. But on the more operational side, which is, I think, the focus of your question, I think the more important aspect would be, for instance, concentrating on mechanisms for understanding how a COI, a community of interest, works. Because the difference between communities of interest and other groups is that this is supposed to be multi-stakeholder. All these other groups were always single actor. They're always governments or private sector or civil society. So they had their own norms that developed in the case of governments over centuries, and they don't have to really figure out exactly what is the process to come to an agreement. So when we talked about what a community of interest involved, and this is all detailed in our report, we have a couple of principles that we think we should be good for establishing a common framework. And the, the really interesting thing about a community of interest, it can also bring together various norms that are similar, but not exactly the same and concentrate on what's the most important thing, which is the output, not necessarily our own individual flags and logos, but actually what we're trying to accomplish. So this is what I think the community of interest model is particularly good at facilitating. We put forward um, a couple of principles to perhaps get the discussion going, but this is, again, the beginning of the discussion, and we look forward to further input. Thank you very much. Um, Madeline, there's in a way nothing new about norms. They've been around for a long time. There's been a lot of sort of um, pre-cyber discussions about them. I'm wondering, is there anything that you think we can learn from that and apply to the challenges that we're dealing with today as a community and, uh, and perhaps implement? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things you, you um, mentioned earlier were these frameworks and um, looking at how some actors have implemented norms or how they've or how I would say they've attempted to demonstrate that they abide by a norm or they recognize a norm. Um, and some of that is documented in your paper. So the, 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 um, and the steps that John outlined that, that Microsoft is taking, um, governments have done this. So the UK and, and, and Australia, for example, have, um, have published papers where they 
basically map on initiatives or steps that they have taken to, to uh, demonstrate how they uh, meet or abide by, by the, the GGE norms, for example. Um, I think in terms of the way forward, um, one of the things that we really need to do, and, and, and this is something that's been an ongoing theme through the, the IGFs that a lot of us around this table have been talking about for years, is just this uh, greater, greater um, discussion and communication with the technical sector. Because, um, and I just want to flag that we have this session tomorrow at, at 10.35 that would follow on very nicely from this one, where we're looking at uh, in bringing the policy community and the technical community together to discuss how, how we can operationalize norms. Um, because really what we've seen is that the technical community largely comes in at the end now where we start to think, right, we, we've agreed these principles or these, or we've proposed these ideas that we, we think we can all get behind. And now when the rubber hits the road, actually, and this falls to, to someone to actually uh, operationalize what is involved. And um, I, I think that's been a, an ongoing problem through, through the, the, norms, um, the norms development process. Um, but I'd also say that we do see plenty of examples of norms that have been uh, very, uh, very successfully implemented. And even I was thinking today when I was looking at the, um, at the, the GCSC norms, the, the norm that state or non-state actors will not uh, develop and, and use botnets, we could say really that is, I mean, we can't imagine any state actor or non-state actor who would openly declare uh, or, or would openly develop a botnet and use it. So we could, we could even say, well, that's a very settled norm then, because no one would do that without denying it or, or trying to hide it. So that's, that's good. That's success. Thank you very much, Madeline. I, I, I would argue one challenge that we'll continue to have, though, with that still is that because of the, the challenges involved in attribution, it still becomes very difficult to actually determine that some of those things don't happen. So that's, uh, that's probably a topic for a whole other panel. But uh, thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, John, I'd like to get your perspective on, do you think that uh, the work that's happening today with collecting best practices, getting others to sort of adopt them, is that sufficient or do you think there is a need for a framework or something more formal? I think there's a, a, a simple way to sort of um, kind of bifurcate thinking about norms uh, implementation uh, between its skill and, and, and will. Um, and whether, when there's not implementation and norms don't seem to be being adhered to, uh, the question is, do, do you have a skill problem or do you have a will problem? In other words, is, is someone unable or is an organization or a country unable to implement that norm uh, or, or are they simply unwilling to? And so to your, to your question specifically as to whether or not collecting uh, best practices, uh, sharing best practices, highlighting what, 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 what's been helpful in certain circumstances, um, that really gets to that, that skill question. Uh, you, you're talking about, um, countries and organizations that, that may just not know how to practice good cyber hygiene, who may not have a level of necessary uh, awareness to keep themselves, their users, customers, citizens safe, um, or to protect their critical infrastructure. Um, and so this is where capacity building initiatives um, led by groups, uh, in particular the, the GFCE, are so important. And, and Microsoft continues to be a, a strong supporter um, of efforts taken there. Um, not, not just on um, maybe what we more traditionally think about as cybersecurity capacity building, but also uh, cybersecurity diplomacy capacity building. How do you engage in these international conversations? How do you start to build trust? Um, the Cybersecurity Tech Accord has also been actively engaged in uh, making sure that we're able to uh, share best practices. And, and we feel as though in cooperation with governments, including uh, the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office, trying to develop a sort of compendium of existing awareness resource uh, efforts across the, the Commonwealth is helpful in, in, in sharing what is taking place and letting people learn across cultures um, and, and across divides what, what's been helpful. So I think there's a lot of goodwill to be used up there and, 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 and it, uh, gains to be made. Um, but that really is still just half of the equation. Um, the other half is going to be that, that will piece and environments in which, in particular, national governments are, are unwilling, perhaps, to, to abide by what are norms of expectations, in which case, uh, as Professor Carr pointed out, there's a good question as to whether you have a norm. Um, because if no one's following it, it's not, it's not really there. 
Um, and so to that end, I think we think about this as, as having two possible solutions. One is increased recognition of existing expectations, uh, perhaps getting to, to Dr. Klimberg's point as well in terms of if we increase the recognition and perhaps even proliferation of, 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 of norms, but if they're talked about more, if we socialize them more, if we internalize these expectations, then when, we're, when they're violated, there can be that knee-jerk reflex of, hey, that that really wasn't appropriate. You know, this, this not only did this target a critical infrastructure sector, um, but it it did so in a way that, that immediately made me think that's, that's something that is out of bounds and we understand it to be out of bounds. Um, that being said, voluntary commitments will, will only ever be so effective. Um, and so we're going to need to move for some of this to more binding obligations, in particular on governments, in terms of what constitutes uh, responsible behavior in cyberspace. Well, thank you very much, John. Then uh, finally, I'd like to start talking a little bit. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, just as a two finger on, on on both those remarks, I was I was doing a funny yes, we're ready with the uh, with the botnet norms. But indeed, that is the point where if that norm is violated, what is the reaction to that norm violation by the community? Will violators be punished in some way or another? <laughs> and I think that is the point in which we actually notice that a norm is being lived up to and internalized by the community. Um, not at the moment when everybody says, well, we don't see it happening and nobody will stand up and said, yeah, I proudly organized this botnet. Um, it is really at the point where people say, you organized this botnet, we should, you know, this is big enough to do an economic sanction or a diplomatic, uh, uh, create an a diplomatic incident around it. Thank you, Olaf. And with that, I'd like to start jumping into the, the very final topic we want to talk about, because we only have about 20 minutes left, and that's assessment. Like, how can we actually see whether norms are adhered to? But, um, Sheetal, you actually brought this up a little bit earlier, and so I'd like to give you the opportunity to also talk about whether you see a need for a framework, and maybe apply that very same thought to um, the assessment of norms adherence. Uh, do you think there's value in building something like that out, and what would that look like? Yeah, I think this question of, well, the previous question around implementation, the road ahead, it's a really tricky one because like um, a number of the panelists have said, you only almost know a norm is being adhered to when it's being adhe adhered to and you just know it because the behavior is happening and it becomes so normalized. So how do you check in on that as it's happening and evolving and because it's kind of, an, it's, it's, um, it's invisible almost. Um, and it, it needs a change and a, tr uh, in, and, in, and a pattern of behavior that changes over time. Um, but I think that saying that there is a need for more documentation of compliance. And it's great to see what Madeline referred to earlier, I think, um, uh, some states leading the way, for example, in the GGE framework, and saying this is, how, this is what we're doing, Australia and the UK, really documenting clearly and publicly, this is how we understand the norm, this is, this is what we do. Um, I think within the, the UN context, um, there's been a lot of calls for that. There's already the opportunity to do that, but, but the, um, just the, the small number of states that have already started doing that shows that there needs to be much more engagement um, with other states and with other stakeholders in encouraging more stakeholders and states in the UN context to share their experience, to share their challenges. Um, so a peer review mechanism, which is inclusive of all stakeholders, is, um, I think would be welcome. Um, sharing of practices, sharing of challenges as well, even in spaces like this, um, is really important. It's already ha started to happen. I think, but um, in order to plug gaps, capacity gaps, we'll need to know what, is, what are the challenges that are being faced in implementing a norm. For example, is it when it comes to supply chain security, just the nature of, of um, different products being all over the you know, world, globally distributed, is that, is that a challenge? Okay, well then th that's something we need to deal with. So there needs to be more clarity on the challenges being faced, and I think there needs, needs to be more documentation documentation of existing and successful efforts um, and um, different stakeholders be willing to share those which is why I think the BPF report and effort is such a great one and I hope that we can continue that um, whether it's here or in other spaces like like the GFC has also been mentioned one thing I would say as well is that there are lots of ways that norms can be implemented and they can act as policy tools so they can be useful for governments um, as a reference 
um, how do I improve cybersecurity globally? Uh, well, here is, a, here is an example. Establish a cert that is independent. Um, establish a vulnerability equities process. That's something that can be implemented in national cybersecurity strategy, for example, or if relevant, in, in legislation. So at the national level, there are, uh, there are a variety of ways or mechanisms by which these norms can be used as policy tools and implemented. Um, and I think we will see a lot more of that um, in the future. I, I, I hope so, anyway. Thank you very much, Sheetal. Um, with that, we'll move over to our uh, remote panelist, Karina. Karina, you mentioned earlier uh, cooperation and that very specific incident that kind of led to better cooperation and better standardization of um, how different teams work together. Have, um, do you have any interesting ideas or suggestions on how we could approach measuring or assessing whether a norm is in place and is actually being lived up to? Um, yes, um, I, I can tell you that I believe that at the national legal level is necessary to sign treats such as the Budapest Convention is the one first need um, in order to assess whether the standards are met or not. A country, a city, and agency should have a standard board to measuring the maturity level of cybersecurity which we usually call a gap um, in order to take this as a starting point and put together uh, an action plan. Um, for say some of the measures that we can implement to evaluate if the standards are met are definition and monitoring the KPAs, K performance indicators, dividers into three dimensions, um, strategic, tactical, and operational, development of willing follow-up of meetings of for project in execu 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 execution, sorry, <laughs> and general monthly evaluation for the station of they belong and development of corrective or contingency plans. Um, the good practices described in ISO 27002 of the information security and all the family uh, and all related of is are a good example of control to be implemented. And we can share the experience with whoever found necessary to, to, to know. Thank you very much, Karina. Those are some good examples of um, ways of actually assessing um, in the, uh, from, the, from the technical community. Then um, Olaf and Madeline, I'd also like to get both of your perspectives on assessment. Um, is there a good example that you can think of? Maybe let's start with you, Olaf. Again, for manners, because that's, that's sort of the, the perspective of a very tiny area, the assessment of the implementation of the norm is much more technical. We can actually measure uh, uh, the measures that have been taken by the community to validate uh, resources, to register resources, to do signatures, and so on and so forth. Um, I think that is important. Um, it is an important tool first to show the impact of uh, 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 the, the norm, the agreement that routing security should improve and see that the agreement to that norm actually has an impact. Um, but it's also important to uh, hold uh, violators of the norm uh, accountable. This is a difficult project. Uh, this is a difficult thing uh, because in the routing sphere, an incident might also be a typo. It might not be a, a, a thing that is, that is malicious. Um, and so that, that type of uh, analysis you need to do very careful, um, and that is a, an ongoing l cycle that we're going through with our community uh, around what do we measure? Uh, is what we're measuring of good quality? Are data sources of good quality? Um, and so this is an ongoing conversation also with the stakeholder community, because I have to say Manners is a stakeholder community-driven effort, not a true multi-stakeholder uh, effort. Um, 
getting to a better quality I, is, is incredibly uh, important for the success of, of this, uh, this project. And I do think that that also applies to other type of normative, you know, uh, uh, tracking. If you look at uh, um, uh, uh, violations of other norms, it is, a, it is important that the attribution of those violation, uh, violations is done correctly, because otherwise, um, your your watchdog function becomes uh, uh, tainted and and might become unrelevant, at which point um, progress in your norm uh, implementation might halt. So I think the quality of the of the of the norm observatory, so to speak, is uh, is is of importance. Uh, I think that is a lesson that we are learning currently from Manners, and that is applicable elsewhere as well. Thank you, Olaf. And then uh, finally, Madeline, uh, you mentioned earlier that quite often you see it because people speak up and they share that they don't agree with something that happened. Do you think there's any more formalization that may happen in that space, or what are your thoughts? Well, I think, I think that the assessment of norms is, um, is, is deeply problematic. And uh, the easier part, if we think of norms as, as this collective expectation of, of what is proper behavior, then the easier part to assess is certainly some positive behavior. If we, if we look at those norms, some of them are about uh, state actors doing something or non-state actors, and some of them are about restraint, about not doing something. And the not doing something is, is much more problematic for the reasons of attribution. But, but the, the positive acts that state, state actors or non-state actors will do X, Y, and Z will always be easier to, to assess for compliance, and that's probably the place to begin. Um, but I think just also, I wanted to pick up on some of John's comments because I thought they were very astute. This, this uh, recognition that norms are very social, this is a social process where we agree what is, is and is not appropriate, um, and they do need to be socialized. So even by talking about how we, ca we can assess positive behavior is a, is a socialization process. Um, but also, as, as John pointed out, sometimes norms just aren't enough. And sometimes that social process just isn't adequate. And there we need rules. And rules are, are, you know, are, are a, different, uh, a different kettle of fish. I think the main challenge for, for this is, is attribution. And, and we know that attribution, any, any Pol policymaker or politician will, will say that attribution is a deeply political act, and it's not, it's not simply a matter of technical attribution, it's whether they can, they can act on that information. And, and if they attribute without providing you know, clear evidence, that unfortunately can undermine trust in, in the international community. So yeah, I'd begin with the positive actions for assessment. Thank you very much, Madeline. Now, we'll keep about six minutes for, uh, for questions, but before we go there, uh, I wanted to give uh, Natalie van Ramdong from the EU ISS um, a really quick moment to talk a bit about a session that they did earlier in the week, because every year in the BPF, we try to bring together some of the learnings from sessions that are really very related to our topic, and I thought there was one specific one that you organized that is uh, very relevant to what we're trying to do here. So. Thanks so much, Martin, for giving me the floor. And thanks, everyone, uh, uh, for creating this BPF report. Uh, very useful. Um, we actually used it to start uh, a workshop on Monday where we wanted to look at the implementation because when we talk about this implementation process, it always remains very vague and abstract. Um, and we wanted to see if it was possible <coughs> to actually discuss this implementation on a very practical level. Um, so I'm, I just quickly wanted to explain what the workshop was about because I think one of the biggest assets of the workshop was the workshop itself, uh, not necessarily the outcomes. Um, but what we did was we took four specific UNGG roles. Uh, we focused on the UNGG because it is uh, the, the most universal one right now. We focused on the human rights norm, uh, the critical infrastructure protection, uh, the protecting the supply chain, and the reporting vulnerabilities. Um, and we asked our participants uh, to look at which role they see themselves fulfill in this norm. Um, and we defined five uh, uh, roles because you need to steer the conversation. Um, and those roles were uh, opinion shaping, uh, rule making, problem solving, monitoring of norms, and building community. Um, and so we asked 
participants to really look at what n role are you actually playing in this norm, uh, what actions are you already taking, so really look at, at how concretely are you contributing to this, and what challenges do you face when you want to fill in a different role. Um, and what we saw was that um, most stakeholders are already participating in this whole norms process, but hadn't actually thought about what concrete actions they're taking. Uh, what we also saw was that there a lot of challenges are recurring, um, but a lot of challenges are also um, already solved by different stakeholders. So what Chital was saying there, the fact that civil society has become very good at this uh, norms observation, um, it's something that other stakeholders were saying, we don't have access to that information. Uh, for us, it's really hard to do this monitoring. And so this exchange of best practices of uh, this, this whole norm observation and implementation uh, was actually very valuable. Um, and we were talking earlier with Chital that um, this is a, a type of, of workshop, a concrete uh, exercise that could be scaled to a bigger level. So um, it's something that maybe could be done online, could be an outcome of the BPF. Um, but we thought it was very useful and we heard a lot of good feedback from the participants. Thank you very much for sharing that, Natalie. Um, we'll jump into questions and let's first check if we have any uh, questions from our remote participants. No. Nothing? Okay, then in that case, uh, there's, uh, I see a hand at the back of the room, and then we'll go to the front here. Yes, uh, the gentleman at the, at the back with the, yes. Hello, Alejandro Pisanti. Congratulations for the workshop. I would like to very briefly uh, add a point that I've made also during the online discussion, or previous to the session. Uh, many of these norms are uh, coming from different regimes. Uh, they are coming from uh, the, the ones we see from coming from the GGE, OEWG, and other groupings are intergovernmental or multilateral, and they are premised on the idea that the states have the authority to emit them, to agree upon them, and eventually to enforce them. Whereas uh, the practical work that uh, people like Karina Virarda and many of those present here, I see Christine Huepers uh, from the Brazil CISERT, uh, they, they work on things that come from all regimes including, of course, a multi-stakeholder and sheer practice. So you have to go across borders, and you maybe have to protect your GDPR-protected users in a European country by asking someone else to violate their GDPR obligations in order to inspect traffic and tell you what's going on in order to avert an incident. Uh, the effectiveness of these norms is especially questionable or challenged when you are going across regimes. And this... Uh, this should be taken into account whether you're taking your norms from governments. Uh, uh, and the final point, which is the implementation, is that uh, if norms are not written with implementation in sight, as very often happens, they will be useless. You have norms that, are, that look perfect, they define cybercrime, they define the conduct, the origin, and so forth, but you will never be able to actually trace back an attack because of the attribution problem. So you've wasted a lot of time and you could allow people to be much more free if you didn't have this uh, un unapplicable norm and let them do their actual search and say search work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. I thought I saw two more hands here. Was it uh, Juan and Pablo who bought? Um, we'll give you 30 seconds as well to, for your comment or question, and then we'll take it back to the, the panel. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, I have more a request than a question because, uh, as I always said, the best practice forum is one of the most useful features of the IGF. This is like having a consultancy, very high level consultancy for people or, or stakeholders like us that we cannot afford that level of consultancy. And because your documents like this one that we're discussing are very useful e even for our, for our work that we're doing. So I, my request is the following. Uh, You've been analyzing there are some positions of countries, but now in the, in the framework of the open-ended working group in the United Nations, countries are beginning, states are beginning to submit their positions. It will be very useful because many of us, many s small states, we don't have big delegations to sift through all that material. If the <laughs> best practice forum could keep on doing what he's been doing now by analyzing those contributions and extracting uh, the, uh, the features of those. That would be a very uh, um, useful document that I could even suggest that it could be submitted as an official document for the uh, convener of the Open Ending Working Group. I think that this is the thing that we are always asking, to have this synergy between different organizations, even within the, the UN. Well, Best Practice Forum is more than UN. 
So uh, uh, that is my uh, request that please take into consideration. Thank you. Thank you for the input, Pablo. Just um, that, uh, praising the work and the important work of the Best Practices Forum. And secondly, I think there could be a good sequel in the workshop that we're organizing as well on cyber norms tomorrow at 10.30 at Sal Europa, and you're very welcome to join. So, small advertisement. Thank you very much. Uh, since none of those were really true questions, uh, Wout, is yours a question for the panel? Okay, uh, is there any question or otherwise we'll give Wout the opportunity to also provide some input? Okay, we have one question there and then Wout will go to you for that final remark. Um, Tasha, government, uh, consultant for German government. Um, I have a question on what Olaf said. Um, he mentioned routing security. And uh, we would like to implement more routing security for our systems. But, and there is a standard, it's called BGP SEC, but it's not implemented. There is no device really supporting it. And it's not foreseeable for the next years that it will be widely implemented. So we really would like to strengthen the cybersecurity and Perhaps it would be a good norm because uh, um, address hijacking will be prevented by this. It's a huge international strategic problem. But there is no infrastructure you can buy on the market to implement. What to do about it? Olaf, can you address that in 20 yeah, seconds or less? Yeah, I'll try to address this in 20 seconds or less. Um, uh, BGPSEC has its uh, issues in deployment because it, uh, it sometimes discloses uh, business relationships and that is a strong economic incentive to deploy security measures. Um, however, um, one of the things that the manners uh, 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 call, call the norms call for is uh, a global validation. Um, global validation is, uh, for instance, origin validation um, uh, using RPKI. Um, we don't call for RPKI specifically as an implementation, but that is certainly one of the paths that the global community currently is taking up. And what we see is that the tools that are being made available in the community over, say, the last year or so, uh, there's an amazing pickup in, for instance, open source implementations of validators. And I think that the combination of easy tooling in the context of RPKI, which pro provides origin validation of routes, and uh, that's a rather technical description, um, will help with uh, improving the security of the routing system. Um, I think we're very far along from having anything that even looks like path validation, because that is a technical problem that we haven't collectively solved solved without disclosing these, uh, these business secrets. Thank you, Olaf. And uh, while we do have to leave this room shortly, but you have 20 seconds for your last uh, comment. 20 seconds, okay. Um, we did, as you know, the pilot project, and I won't go into it due to time, on deployment of internet standards and why it's slowly happening. We discussed five topics, and I'll just stick to that. There needs to be a created a positive business case for deployment. The same will go for norms. Perhaps we need laws and regulations. That was another topic discussed. The third one is they need to be built into products by design. And how do we organize that as a, as a world that we can buy safe products? The fourth one is these internet standards need to be understood and they need to be deployed, distributed into all the network, little networks that exist around the world in a language people can understand and not as a technical standard, because nobody understands that and why it's important for them. The fifth one is if we allow our children to leave vocational trainings and universities without having a clear idea about cybersecurity, safe websites, etc., it will mean that they come into their career without the knowledge they need to actually build the safer world. We came up with a whole set of recommendations which will be published 31st of January next year, and which will give a way forward to these discussions and who do we need actually to make this happen. So my voice is going, but thank you very much for the 
35 seconds. <laughs> thank you very much, Wout. And thank you all who have come today. Also, special thanks to Alyssa, our online moderator, uh, Ben Wallace and uh, Marcus Kommer, the uh, co-conveners of this BPF, all of our panelists that we had today, and specifically all of you who came and those of you who contributed to either our call or on the mailing list. And you can still continue to do that. We're working towards the final report by December 9th. But if you have thoughts after this session, please do mail them, either as a contribution or to the BPF mailing list. Thank you very much.